first of all, I'd like to, again, thank everybody for staying. It's always the last talk that uh, uh, people start to skip out, but um, this is also sponsored by Eloquent, so uh, a big round of applause and thanks to them uh, for making this meeting happen even so. Um, you know, normally when you, when you hear talks, you know, you, you get the, you get the experts talking and, uh, um, you get the experts talking, um, and, and really, you know, and, and that it's good that Chol's here and, and certainly our, our colleagues from Korea who've done, you know, uh, orders of magnitude more certainly than I have. Um, but, you know, I thought it would be good particularly to introduce to members of CAS and, and uh, you, you know my feelings on, on um, you know, why this hasn't taken off. And I thought, you know what, let me share how I got started um, just doing endoscopic surgery. And I, and I, and I will tell you that I, I haven't been doing it for very long. Um, and and you heard a little bit of it at, at my first talk. So literally, how did I get started? And I, and I wasn't kidding when I said, you know, how do you get trained on endoscopic spine surgery? Um, and, you know, if you Google it, you see, you know, multiple options here and you just start clicking through and going, well, you know, which one should I pick? Um, I, I read this Becker's article on this paper that Tony Young has done, you know, and, and Tony Young talks about doing, I don't know, a, 10 or 15,000 of these operations. And, you know, as a beginner, you think, man, that's such a huge uphill climb. It, 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 you know, you're just, it, it's almost um, uh, overwhelming. Um, and what was interesting is that even, you know, on, in Tony's paper, he says, really, there's a, while there is a progressive increase in interest, um, there's no, there's not no, but there's a lack of what he called structural training opportunities, uh, a challenging learning curve, and I can certainly attest to that, and then commercial pressures. I think you could even broaden that, just say financial pressures, right? Um, and so, you know, even before he got started, I was like, oh man, I'm never going to get this started. And this was probably two years ago for me. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty persistent and, uh, you know, at times I could be relentless. Um, so I said, okay, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep clicking. So here's, um, you know, here's, here's another website from JoyMax. And I thought, oh, well, let me see what they offer. And, you know, you, you see the, the workshops and you're like, wow, there's all these level one, level one and two workshops. And, and, and you kind of look through and say level one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, you're, you're like, wow, there's, there's a lot of steps here. And when am I ever going to get, you know, my training wheels, when am I going to get my learner's permit? Um, and so, you know, again, going back to my other talk, it's like, you don't really understand or know where, you know, what you need to do to get started. Um, you know, this is another doctor, Dr. Tony Mork, who does a lot of endoscopic surgery and, and even he offers a training class. I'm like, I'm like that. That seems kind of cool. Let me check that out. And and here are some of his courses. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. And and, and granted, they're intensive hands-on courses. And you know, you, you really should look into it. But you know, it's just a it's a pretty large outlay. You know, in terms of time away from practice. In addition to that, you, you know, you're paying a lot of money. And so. You know, I was just, again, I was kind of overwhelmed and, it, and I went through a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, spits and spurts in terms of, you know, I, I'm going to do it this year and, and you never end up doing it. Um, so, it, and again, I mentioned it, you know, this, this course at NAS, which I thought was a really good introduction and, and, and really started to, to get me thinking about what, what kind of endoscopic surgery did I want to do? And, and again, what did it mean? Um, and then I, I bought books. So, you know, uh, you'll notice a lot of the authors on here. These are authors who, you know, we know. Um, Jin Sang, I, I haven't clicked on your book yet. I will though, and uh, I'll buy your book as well. Maybe I can get one of those t-shirts too. You, know, you should throw that in there. Um, you know, and there's, there's, of course, there's lots of YouTube videos on endoscopic surgery and I watched those, you know, I went to MediView and watched a lot of those. Um, 
And, and, you know, a lot of it was, you know, I really just need to educate myself. And, you know, again, I, I bring this, uh, this paper up uh, in particular, again, just looking at, you know, what are you talking about when you say, I'm going to do endoscopic surgery? Um, and so really in terms of, you know, if I had sort of a, a, a framework, it's that, look, there really are very few residencies or, or programs, you know, that, that, that have endoscopic surgery as part of the training program, right? Because most you know, experienced endoscopic surgeons are in private practice. Again, you, you know, we can go to Korea and that, that'd be something I'd love for us to do as cast members, you know, fly, to, fly to Seoul or fly to South Korea and, and, and spend some time with all, all of you all who are just so experienced. Um, and, but really you end up depending a lot on industry and other things. And like I said, being kind of weekend warrior spine surgeon, um, but again, hopefully with NASA's course and, and other societies, and, and I believe ISAS does, a, does an endoscopic course, um, uh, you know, I, I think these are, you know, these are good opportunities that, you know, we ought to think about, okay? Um, so just a little bit about Eloquence, which is the company I landed on. Um, I thought the first thing that, that I found to be most interesting about training with Eloquence was that uh, I had a one-on-one -on -one training session and, and, you know, if you, you know, we've all been at these large cadaver courses where it's six people crowded around a cadaver and, um, you know, it, you get maybe one shot at it, you get to maybe hold the, you know, the scope once and kind of go, okay, great. But, you know, you're not going to come out of there comfortable, um, you know, comfortable doing a scope case on your own. Uh, I, I know now, you know, I was trained in New York, which is obviously very close to Boston where I live. Um, but I believe they have a West Coast uh, um, uh, facility as well. So, you know, you do have to get there, right? So there is some, you know, frictional cost of learning this. But, you know, again, it's, it's sort of up to you as a surgeon to decide, you know, uh, you know how much is this worthwhile to you and, and how much do you want to do it? So Eloquence has been around for a very, very long time. Um, they, you know, they were actually, I believe the, yeah, they're, there's the OEM provider of Surgimax and for a lot of the other companies, they decided, you know, we're going to go out on our own. A very important thing to remember though, is that the Eloquence equipment, all their scopes are essentially agnostic to the tower that it's attached to. So if your hospital has a contract with, you know, Arthrex, or has a contract with Stryker, it doesn't matter. Um, and so in terms of, you know, I kind of half joked, but kind of mentioned about, um, you know, the, the capital cost that your hospital administrator is gonna look at you and say, you know, geez, I, you know, Brian, I don't know if we can do that. Um, you know, there, there's, there's certain advantages here. So um, in terms of, you know, what the scopes do, you can use the scopes for any, any procedure. And again, there are, <laughs> you know, a, a laundry list of procedures and pathologies that you're going to run into. And uh, again, it's, it, it's, it really helps to educate yourself first about what, you know, procedures specifically, you know, A, the speaker is referring to and B, which ones you want to do are of most interest to you. Um, one thing I do like about the set is that, uh, you know, it's, as you can see in the top right corner, it's, it's two small boxes and that's the whole thing. That's literally all you need. Um, here's another picture of the, of the instruments and the various punches, you know, for the orthopedic surgeons out there who are doing knee menisectomies, you know, we're familiar with the shape and angulations of some of these. Um, um, and it, while it's not, a, you know, very similar to doing uh, knee arthroscopy, uh, some of the handles and some of the, um, the biting tips are, um, are familiar. Um, their Surgeon Max drill, it's actually a drill that goes in through the, uh, goes in through the cannula. And so again, like, uh, like uh, um, we saw previously, you know, it enables you to do laminotomies, uh, bilateral uh, uniportal decompressions. So, uh, and again, having the diamond tip is, is I think really critical. Uh, I'm just definitely too chicken to use a, any kind of fluted drill. Um, and the trigger flex is, is right now becoming one of my very, very favorite tools. Um, I, I, you know, it has a little curve and as you squeeze those handles, it, it, um, you know, it'll, it'll actually help you go around bends. Uh, this is the wonderful uh, Eloquence Global team. <laughs> this is nice. Uh, I will point out Brian Duda, who's down at the bottom, uh, was the one who trained me. 
Um, he, he has a patience of, of, of uh, Job. Uh, th this, this man uh, can <laughs> really put up with anything. So a uh, big shout out to you, Brian, if you're here. Um, and again, as far as training goes, you know, our distinguished faculty who also are cast members have been loyal cast members are, are constantly giving talks and really give such good talks. You know, I'd really encourage you to get on to a webinar at the very least. Um, and these guys are really reachable. I, I don't know if you either follow them on Instagram, have emails or anything. I mean, you send them a message. I mean, they, they get back to you pretty much right away. So um, as, 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 you know, way up on the food chain as they are, they're really approachable individuals and it's been really my pleasure to get to know them. So of course you're like, well, what was your first case? And I don't think this is my very first case. It might've been my second, but be, uh, this was a, uh, uh, 40, yeah, 48 year old gentleman. He's actually a physical therapist in my area. I mean, he did, you know, over a year, just a PT, I think he'd done some injections, severe, severe debilitating right thigh pain. And he had, of course, gotten, I don't know, I, I think I was like his fifth or sixth opinion. And everyone had a slightly different opinion. I mean, everything from a T-lift to, you know, open microdiscectomy to a metrix tube. Um, and when I had suggested doing a full endoscopic transferaminal, um, he really kind of latched on. Uh, and even after that, he had two, you know, he had me given two more injections just to make sure. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, the start of it is all about the targeting, right? It's, um, you know, the, whether you're doing biportal, intralaminar, uniportal, transferaminal, uniportal, extraframinal, it's really about getting, remember, you got to get the working tube in the right place. And so it challenges your three-dimensional anatomy, which is actually what I've been really loving about uh, endoscopic surgery. It forces you to really think about where the pathology is and, 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 and um, Jinsen just gave a really, you know, really important point about a symptomatic diagnosis versus a radiologic diagnosis, right? It, again, it challenges you to think through what the problem is and, um, uh, you know, but getting the starting point is, and again, the, the more experienced guys can agree or disagree with me, is just really, really critical. Um, and here's just an intro view of that case. So you can see on the right, uh, they have these cool little instruments. So I'm gonna end with a video. I'm gonna speak while the video is playing. Um, and again, just remember this is a right L23 um, uh, discectomy. So this is the, this is the, uh, the ablator, uh, that's epidural fat, but just to orient yourself, okay, dorsal and caudal, uh, so the patient's laying with the head to the right, right? And then you can see the disc already, right? You're like, you're already there, um, which, you know, is, is pretty impressive. Oh. So yeah, you can see the, you can see the fat plane, um, and there's me just sort of, uh, again, burning epidural fat. Uh, there's the, the, the Surgimax uh, blader, which I really like. Again, so there's disc right there. You see it? And then you can, and I'm showing, what I'm trying to show is the, the fat uh, pulsating. And there I am with the pituitary. I'm sitting there thinking, man, I, I believe I can fly here. I can be like Chol Kim uh, and I can do it. I can, oh no, right? You see all that bleeding and you're like, oh man. That's the challenge, right? You get in and you're kind of, you know, you're kind of lost and you kind of freak out for a little bit. And you're like, oh. My view's even cleaner. Now I can be like Luke. I can be like, I can be like Dr. Kim. I believe I can fly. Oh no, see. So what you end up with is, is you know, a visual field that you're not always comfortable with. Um, and I think that's part of the learning curve. But if you persist, um, you end up with this. And there you can see, um, you know, the nerve root right there. And again, you can see where the disc material used to be. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's doable. And, and this case, you know, took me probably about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. So take home message, I think, you know, despite the fact that, you, you know, we're, we're a bit fearful of, of um, you know, jumping in and doing this, it, it is doable. Um, you do want to and have to commit to wanting to do it. It's not going to come to you. You have to seek these opportunities out right now. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities out there that don't necessarily cost a lot of money um, and that you can do and, and make it work for you. Um, you know, my choice of working with developments is based on, you know, the, certainly the economics uh, have been um, helpful for me. Um, and again, the training, uh, I highly recommend, you know, you know, as soon as 
COVID restrictions end and you can actually start to fly or if you're within driving distance, I, I'd encourage you to do that one-on-one, um, -on -one, so thank you. Can I pose a question? It's a two-part question. First of all, what part of the endoscopic surgery is the most challenging to learn? Uh, and two, how many, how much training do you think you need? Like how many times on a cadaver, start to finish, do you think you need to do the procedure to feel comfortable to do your first case on a real live human? So the, the, first, the first thing, the, the biggest challenge initially is the first picture you get when you stick the scope in, right? Because you stick it in, you're like, the heck am I looking at? I have no idea. And you're, you think, man, I'm going to stick this pituitary in, and I know I'm going to grab a nerve root. I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a ventral side durotomy and everything's going to go to, you know, to, to, the, to the dumps, right? So the first one is, you know, kind of not panicking. It's kind of like the, the thing when you, you know, when you jump into a swimming pool, right? The first thing you shouldn't do is panic, um, figure out where up is and, and swim and, and, and get out of the pool. Um, and, I, you know, I would say how many cases, you know, I think you need to, you need to spend one very good committed amount of time um, with a cadaver. You need to really spend a lot of time with it. Um, and so it's not just, you know, okay, here, 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 put this, put the dilator that and do, do this and that, you know, it's not about just going through the motions and the mechanics. It's really being able to understand the foraminal anatomy. In fact, um, again, another plug for that NAS course that I went to, there are several talks on really the very, very fine surgical anatomy of the foramen. And, you know, if you, if you really kind of watch these guys and, and, their, and their videos, I mean, these guys are, I mean, they know the foramen and every little subtle, you know, ligament and fiber, you know, like the backs of their hands. They're very comfortable in that space. In the same way, when we started getting good at T-lifts, you know, it took a while before you were really comfortable inside Camden's Triangle, right? Because you've got nerve everywhere, you've blood everywhere, you know, and, and eventually you kind of know where the traversing and the exiting nerve roots are and you really start to develop comfort. And I think that's the same thing. You know, the, 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 the literature suggests, you know, anywhere between 10 to 15 cases to as high as 70 cases is, you know, the average learning curve for an endoscopic surgeon. So, you know, I, I, you know I'm probably not even at 10 yet myself. Um, so uh, I'll let you know. Do you use methylene blue or any kind of chromatodiscogram strategy to stain the disc? I don't. This is outside in, right? So I stay outside of the disc, so I don't go into the disc space. This is this is different from Tony Young's inside out technique. But again, see, there you go. It, it you know, it, it it took me six months to even know that there was a difference there, right? So there's a um, you know knowledge base that you kind of need to develop. It's uh, you know, for anybody who's ever drank German wine, you know exactly what, how I you know you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you read a, a label of German wine, you're like, uh, I don't know, it's white, tastes good. Eventually, you just kind of concede. Um, but, you know, if, if you learn, you learn the vineyards, you learn the kind of wines, and, you know, how, how dry is a dry Riesling, and you start to understand that better. But, you know, again, there's definitely a, a, a core fundamental, you know, chunk of knowledge you need before you can even kind of get into this stuff. 